Welcome to Chapter 10, Recurrence Relations. We are going to revisit something we've talked about in this course and in discrete math already, which is, of course, recurrence relations. So this video will focus specifically on first-order linear homogeneous recurrence relations. A recurrence relation or recursive function essentially defines subsequent terms of a sequence based on previous terms. So obviously the most common one or the most famous one is the Fibonacci sequence, where in order to find a value, we're going to add the two values, oops, not plus, the two values before. Now, this is not a first order recurrence relation. This is actually a second order. So first order is what we're going to focus on in this video, which means we're only depending on one previous term. And homogeneous essentially means that the sum of our values is equal to zero, or this could also be difference of values. So what I mean by that is I could rewrite this as a n minus a n minus one minus a n minus two equals zero or I could rewrite this one as a n minus two, a n minus one is equal to zero. If I were to have something like three n instead, that would make it non-homogeneous and we are not going to worry about those. So here's where we are. And remember, if I'm looking for you to define a recurrence relation, this is essentially what I'm asking for. So if I just said define the recurrence relation, that's all we would have to do. And typically I would give you this series or sequence and have you define it. So in this video, we're actually going to take it a step further and try to find the explicit definition. So this is to define the recurrence relation. This is telling me where to start. And this one is telling me subsequent terms. And then of course, this is important to tell me for what values of n. So it's always going to give me one initial starting point. And notice one is not listed as one of my values in the sequence and that's okay. A sub zero kind of gives just a starting point, a launching pad to start from. So again, to use this to come up with the sequence, I would say to find a one, I need to take two, times a of zero. Well, a of zero is defined as one, so that gives me two. To find a two, that tells me to take two times a one, and a one was two, so two times two is four. A three is two times a two, and we just found that a two was four, and so my next value is eight. That's where these values came from, is just reusing that same definition over and over and over. Now, recurrence relations are great, and I could find any number that I wanted, and if you'll note, I have found a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, etc. If I asked you to find a10, that wouldn't take us too long using this method, but what if I said find a100? Well, I don't want to have to write all of that out to find all the way up through A199 in order to find A200. So that is when we might look at trying to write them explicitly. And that is sometimes a difficult task, but I'm going to show you how to deal with that in this case. It's not too bad for this particular situation. One way to go about discovering the recurrence relation, how to write this explicitly, is using back substitution. So if we'll think about a to the n plus one is two times a to the n, or keep in mind, this can also be written a n is equal to two a n minus one. I'm essentially saying the same thing there, so it's really just a matter of personal preference. Quite often we want it written as a n instead of a n plus one. So let's go ahead and go with this. So what I can do here is I can say, what if I wanted to replace a sub n minus one? Well, how could I write that? I could write a n minus one as two 
times a n minus 2. Well, let's continue that. Keep this 2, keep this 2. I can replace a n minus 2 with 2 a n minus 3. And we can see where this pattern is going. So if I wanted a n, it's really going to be 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times however many 2's, and however many 2's we'll talk about in just a moment, times a n minus k. So k being how many terms am I trying to find? Well, let's say I'm trying to find all the way down to where I'm using a zero. So that would mean that I'm really looking at a n equals two times two times two, et cetera, et cetera, times a n minus n. How many twos do I have? How many twos do I have? I have n twos. So how is this helpful? Well, let's go ahead and take all of those twos and sort of consolidate them. So really, I can write that a n is equal to 2 to the n, because I have n twos, times a to the n minus n, which is a to the 0. Now in this case, I know what a to 0 is. a to the 0 is 1. So really, what I've done is I've found that I can find any value in my sequence by taking 2 to that power. So let's remember what our original sequence was. We started at 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, etc. So this was a 1, this was a 2, this was a 3, this was a 4, this was a 5. If I wanted to find, say, a 4, a 4, according to this definition, written explicitly, so this is the explicit definition, a 4 tells me I can take 2 to the 4th. 2 to the 4th is 16. Does it match what I found originally using my definition of the recursive relation? Yes, it does, so I feel pretty good about it. So let's think about essentially what happened, and if this would happen again and again, I looked at 2 to the n times a sub 0. So this was my starting point. And what was 2? Two? 2 was whatever factor I was multiplying by. So let's take a look at our next example and see if this pattern will hold. The example we just looked at and this example are known as geometric progressions. A geometric progression essentially means to find the next value in the sequence. I'm just going to multiply by some common ratio. So I can either use division to come up with that common ratio, or most often it's pretty easy to figure it out. 5 times 3 will give me 15. 15 times 3 will give me 45. 45 times 3 will give me 135, and so on and so on. But again, use division if you're having trouble coming up with that value. So if I just asked you to define the recurrence relation, remember all I need is where's my starting point and where do I go from there? So I have to define that a sub 0 is 5, because that gives me where am I getting started. Then I have to decide, how did I get to the next one? Well, to find the next one, then I'm going to take 3 times the previous term. And notice then I've specified that n is greater than or equal to 1. So this part is very important, because otherwise, all I'm telling you to do is multiply by 3, and I don't know where I started. So this could also use that same recurrence relation just with a different starting point. Now going back to our first example that we did and the example we just looked at, my question is can you write both this sequence 
and this sequence explicitly. Now, if you feel the need to, you can certainly use back substitution, which is the way that I came up with it before. Or if you feel pretty confident about that little pattern that we were beginning to develop, feel free to use that. When you are ready, press play to see how you did. So again, to write the recurrence relation, that is my recurrence relation. We had already come up with that previously on the last slide. And if you'll notice, this is the exact same recurrence relation. So what's the only difference? This one has a starting point of 5. This one has a starting point of 8. So when it comes to the actual defining the recurrence relation, pretty straightforward. The same recurrence relation, different starting point. We're multiplying by 3. To write them explicitly, we looked at an example where we came up with, using back substitution, we came up with a to the n, or a sub n. In our example, previously, we had 2 to the n, a sub 0. Now, that was when this was our common ratio. And of course, this was our starting point. So let's see if that pattern holds true. Our common ratio here is 5. Our common ratio, I'm sorry, common ratio here is 3. Our common ratio here is also 3, meaning I'm multiplying by 3 each time. So does this pattern fit? Well, according to this pattern, I should be able to take, instead of 2 to the n, 3 to the n, multiplied by my first value. That's what I've come up with here. Does it work? Well, again, you can always plug one in to find out. Same thing here. This would tell me 3 to the n, and instead of times 5, times 8. And again, does it work? Yes, it works. It's If I plug in 0, I get 8 times 3 to the 0, which is 1, which is 8. So my first term is 8. 8 times 3 squared. Oops, 8 times 3, sorry, to the first, which is 8 times 3, which is 24. That gives me my next value. So we can see that this pattern does, in fact, work. What we find, then, is that this always holds true for geometric sequences. So again, this is specific to a geometric sequence, where all I'm doing to get to the next value is multiplying by the exact same value. Again, feel free to do a Google search if you want to see the proof by induction. I'm not going to go through that proof with you. So here's one essentially just to remember because it's going to work every time. So the unique solution for the recurrence relation where I'm able to find D, which is that constant ratio uh, or the common ratio, and I'm able to find K, which is the initial value, this is essentially how I'm going to write it every single time. Let's look at another application using that same formula. It says solve the recurrence relation a sub n equals 5 times a to the n minus 1, or a sub n minus 1, where n is greater than or equal to 1, and a of 2 is 175. So notice here what I'm missing. I don't have an initial value. I do have this. This is my equation that I'm going to use. And I do know that 5 is going to be the difference, because it's saying take it times 5 each time. Now what am I going to do? Because I don't know k, and remember k was that starting point, and I don't have that. So what I do have is this little nugget right here. So let's go ahead and see what I can do with that. If I do a sub 2, then that should be k times 5 squared. Well, k times 5 squared is 25, and a2 is 175. So by just solving that simple equation, I'm now finding k. So what is my explicit recurrence relation? Using that 7 for my initial value and writing the recurrence relation as 7 times 5 to the n. Let's take a look at another example of a recurrence relation. Now, obviously, there's a much easier algebraic way to solve this, but let's take a look at how 
this can apply to different situations. So if we have a 6% annual interest compounded monthly, you initially invest $100, how much money is in the account after one year? So we want to model and solve using a recursive relation. So that means don't pull out your compounded monthly formula and plug it in to find out how much money we'll have after a year. I want you to use a recurrence relation. So how would I go about this? And obviously I've given you a little tip here. An annual rate of 6% gives us a monthly rate of 0 0.06 divided by 12 or 0 0.005. So that's what you're earning monthly. So again, how would I go about this? Well, I would start right here. We're saying A sub N is the amount in the account after N months, which means I'm starting with $100. The next month, I will have that $100, and I will add 0.5% of that, so 100 times 0 0.005. Now, remember that this A sub 2 which is the second month, I would take whatever I earned here, which is A1, and then I would also take A1 times 0 .005. So we can see if I continued that pattern, because A2 is really 1.005 times A1, if I continued that pattern, I could find any month as 1.005 A N minus 1 just like I did before when I did sort of that cascading substitution back substitution what's going to happen each time if I replace a n minus 1 I can replace it with 1.005 times a n minus 2 I can replace a n minus 2 with 1.005 a n minus 3 and I can see what that pattern would be is that this is going to give me an explicit formula reduced a little bit gives me this formula. A sub 0 means how much did you start with, so notice all I've done is replace A sub 0 with 100, and that is, and that was this, A n minus n. So essentially I'm taking 100 times 1 1.005 to the n. So after 12 months, how much will I have? Well, now I can use my recursive relation to take 1.005 to the 12th times 100. And if you got your calculator out and used the compounded monthly formula, you would find that those two values do in fact agree. Let's take a look at a trickier example, and this one's actually non-homogeneous, and I'll show you why in just a moment. But looking at this example, we can see right off the bat it's not a geometric progression. If I take 2 times 3, I get 6. If I take 6, well, I'd have to take it times 2 to get 12. 12 times some fraction is 20. We're not multiplying. So what's the pattern that I have? Well, hopefully we can see straight off the bat. I'm adding 2, I'm adding 4, I'm adding 6. So this is a very different progression than what we're used to. So notice what I've done is I've really just written out that a little bit more explicitly. A1 minus A sub 0 is 2. A sub 2 minus A sub 1 is 4, etc, etc. Which is the same thing I was doing here. Just writing it a little nicer. To generalize that pattern, AN minus the term before it would be 2 times N. And does that work for all of these? This would mean that this should be 2 times 1, which is 2. Yes, that works. This one should be 2 times 2, which is 4. Yes, that works. This one should be 2 times 3, which is 6. Yes, that works. So we get the idea that we've done this correctly. Now what I'm going to do is I'm essentially going to add all of these guys up. Now what's going to happen? Uh, I've got an A1 and a minus A1. I've got an A2 and a minus A2. And that telescoping pattern is going to continue all the way down to where all I'm left with is A sub N minus A sub 0. Minus A sub 0. On the right side, adding them up, I've got 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8, etc., all the way up to 2N. 
on the right side, if I factor out a 2, then I've got just values all the way up to n. And then we're going to throw some of our summation formulae back into the mix. So notice this side hasn't changed. On this side, I'm taking that 2, putting it on the outside, and I'm saying I'm going to take the summation as i goes from 0 to n of i. Well, if you'll recall from Calculus 1, from Discrete, from several classes, and even in this class where we reminded ourselves, this is that formula that we can replace the summation with. n times n plus 1 over 2. 2's cancel, so I get n times n plus 1. Notice I've sneakily plugged in that 0 for a sub 0. So really a sub n minus 0, which is just a sub n. So what I've done now is I've come up with the explicit way for me to find any value. And again, I can certainly look at, let's say, 30. So this is a 0, this is a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4. So we're looking at a 5. a 5 we already know is 30, but let's go ahead and make sure 5 times 5 plus 1 would be 5 times 6 would be 30. So we have done our job well. So the beauty is that, again, just as we came up with some formula that we can always use for a geometric progression, this always holds true if I have a recurrence relation that can be written in this format, where I'm taking a value minus the value before it and getting k, which is some constant value. Now remember last time k was 2n, and that's okay, because we're looking at the same value each time when we subtract. We can write that recurrence relation then as follows, which is a n equals a 0 plus the summation as i goes from 1 to n of k. And again, it can be written as a n minus a 0 equals, but really remember when we wrote this explicitly before, we want a n all by itself. So this should be a pretty simple question. I've given you the formula that we just came up with. What I'm asking is, can you use what you know to write this sequence explicitly? Which means I want you to write a sub n equals something explicitly. When you are ready, when you've tried this question fully, press play to see how you did. So again, what I would be looking for is a1 minus a0 is 7, a2 minus a1 is 14, a3 minus a2 is 21. So I had to find that difference first. And what I found the difference to be is 7n. 7n would count as k because that's what I'm getting each time when I subtract, is 7n. So now I'm just going to plug it into this formula. a sub n is equal to my first term, which is 0. And then I'm replacing k with 7n. 7 can move to the outside, just as I've done. n is still this formula. And so if I simplify, that is my formula, 7n times n plus 1 divided by 2.